announced this morning that we are going to be answering a question. Uh, I've been soliciting questions from you, and two of you have responded. So uh, this week we're going to be answering a question that Norman, or not Norman, Gordon, it's two syllables, it's close, uh, submitted. Same IQ. Same IQ. Well, I don't know. Uh, There's more than one Norman, you know. All right. Okay. Okay, so we are uh, going to be in 1 John chapter 2. And uh, a couple of years ago, on our Wednesday nights, we were doing 1 John. And uh, I've done, gone through 1 John several times. So um, we are. So what I decided to do is just go ahead and we'll redo. We're redoing a message that... I preached back in 2019, and I'm sure those who are here will remember word for word what I said, <laughs> so they'll be able to check and see if I did as well this time. All right, well, okay, so here's how we're going to start. How do we know, how do we know that we have come to know God? First John 2, verses 3 to 5 say, by keeping his commandments, that's how we know. How do we know that we are abiding in him? 1 John 2, verses 5 through 6 says, By walking as he walked. We are abiding when we walk the way the Lord walked. So the teaching of those verses points to a comprehensive way of life, the way the Christian tries to live. We should be trying to live, we should model our life on the Lord Jesus Christ. We should do everything we can to try to submit ourselves to his instructions. And so we do that by studying the New Testament, by listening to what it says. Our culture and our world will tell us different things that our culture and our world think is true. But what we should do is what the Bible says. That's the way we should live. So what we want to do then is to get every thought and action subject to the will of God. I would venture to say that none of us are going to say, oh, that's me. Everything I think is holy all the time. None of us are going to say that. Everything I do, everything I say, we're none of us going to say that that is true. However, the, the scriptures continue to urge us in that pattern of life. It's, it is an ideal. It is something that we, we find we cannot achieve perfectly, but we need to, to how's the, we need to cultivate a pattern of decision-making that tends towards holiness, towards what God expects, towards the way God would have us to live. The more we do that, the more we can abide in him and walk with him. So in our text tonight, it's, or tonight, this afternoon, the, the language is a bit uh, cryptic. It's a little bit, sounds like double talk. You'll find that in 1 John. He seems to be saying one thing. He seems to be saying something else. It's a little hard to put it together sometimes. And so the verses that we're going to look at today are like that. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 3 of 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to read, uh, our text is verse 7 and 8. I'm going to read right through to verse 11. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know, know, know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. So obedience is a mark of Christianity. Then by this we know that we are in him. This is the abiding part. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So that's that pattern we were just talking about. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So that text is uh, 
verse 7 and 8. In verse 3 and 4, uh, we have a prominent word, if we keep his commandments. Keep his commandments, all right? The word commandments. We find that word, same word, commandment, three times in verse 7 and one time in verse 8. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you. He starts in verse 7. Then he says on verse 8, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you. So which is it? Is it new or is it not new? Okay, so which is it? All right, so that's one of the puzzling things about the passage. But the proposition for this message is this. The bedrock of the Christian faith is a fresh way of relating to others and to God. The bedrock of the Christian faith is a fresh way of relating to others and to God. And as we work through this passage, we will uh, come to uh, the answer to the question that Gordon raised, <laughs> which it's only part of this message. It's not the whole message. All right, so the first thing, the word beloved in verse 7, is one of John's terms of endearment. He uses beloved here. He uses it in chapter 3, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 21, chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 7, and chapter 4, verse 11. So he uses it quite a bit. He also uses the term little children, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 2, verse 28, chapter 3, verse 18, chapter 4, verse 4, and chapter 5, verse 21. So these two terms, beloved and little children. John has a very tender relationship with the people he's writing to. Uh, I call these his terms of endearment. And so one of the things we have to remind ourselves in, in reading 1 John is that John is writing to people that he assumes are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have personal faith in Jesus Christ. These terms communicate John's deep love for the people to whom he's writing. Now, we don't know exactly who he is writing to. We believe it's a church. There's some, uh, there's some speculation as to which church. We don't know for sure. It's one that obviously they know him. Now, uh, these terms also communicate not only John's relationship with these people, but the relationship of God with these people and God's deep love for them. Uh, they reflect in this as John is walking with God, as he's ministering to these people, they reflect John's pastoral heart. He has a concern for them. Uh, in First Peter, in our Wednesday night studies, we were talking about elders a few weeks ago, and uh, Peter talks about not uh, acting as an overlord. You know, the elder, the pastor, the leader of the church is to be someone who loves the people. He's not there to get what he can get out of his position. He's not there to fill his ego about, I'm the one in charge. Uh, he is there to minister, to serve the people. He's to serve the word of God to the people. It's, he is to serve the people in all kinds of different ways. When there's an emergency, uh, he is to help and be there and to be a help and support and to guide and to give good advice. And the whole goal is to build people up in the faith. He, this is the pastoral heart. And one of the things we find in this book is that these people who he's writing to are under pressure from false teachers. So what he wants to do, John wants to equip them with spiritual confidence and with the divine truth so that they can stand against these uh, teachers. Hebert, in his notes on this, says, In writing to them, John was motivated by a deep, persistent love that desires the welfare of the believers. So when he starts in verse 7, Beloved, he's giving them teaching that comes from his heart and from the heart of God that really wants to communicate to them something that he thinks is very important for their spiritual life. So the next thing we want to talk about is a very specific bedrock commandment that we find in uh, these uh, verses, th this verse. Now, before I get directly to the verse that we're looking at here, uh, I, there is, uh, in my notes, I have, uh, a, the first thing I want to talk about is the contrast between commandments and commandment plural versus singular. 
Now, the, the word, the Greek word for this, John uses frequently. I have a list of verses here in, in uh, here, but I'm not going to recite them all. It, doesn't mean, it won't mean anything to you to recite all those numbers. But in three of the passages, the word is singular. So here in verse 7, notice and 8, he says, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, a singular, but an old commandment, which you have heard from the, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you. So it's a singular commandment. It is also used in the singular in chapter three and verse twenty-three. So let's just take a quick look at that one. All right, and that one says, "This is his commandment." that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. So there's two aspects to this commandment. And they're connected, if you think about it, they're connected to what Jesus called the first and second great commandments. You're to love Jesus Christ or believe in Jesus Christ. So remember Jesus said the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's related to this statement here in 1 John chapter 3. And he says, and love one another. That's the second commandment Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So the commandment, first of all, faith in Christ and love for one another. Singular. It's used singular here. The other one, one more, chapter 4 and verse 21. This commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Notice that. So this is that singular commandment. When he talks about commandments, if we go back to chapter 2, and you notice back there in verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, plural. So when we're talking about the plural, we're talking about all the instructions of the New Testament, all the, the things that God teaches us. But here, what we're talking about in Second John, 1 John 2, 7 Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment, singular. He's writing about a specific commandment. Okay? And so in the context, in verses 9 through 11, he talks about hating his brother and loving his brother. All right? The one who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness, he says. All right? So that's related to this commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. Okay? Um, and so it is pretty clear that the commandment we're talking about is the command to love one another. So where do we get that? It comes from John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, and you also, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. All right, so this, as I said, sums up the second table of the law. Love your neighbor. The first table of the law is summed up by love God. And there's, uh, for that, if you want to write down Matthew 22, 36 to 40, you'll see Jesus discussing these things. Now, John's concern isn't to emphasize the specific commandment. He's assuming they know what it is. Right? And, of course, the context is re referring to it. But what he's emphasizing here is the character of, of this commandment. What is this commandment like? So first of all, it's not new. I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment. So what does that mean? Well, this is a time reference. Both terms emphasize the duration of time. John isn't minting a new commandment for the believers. He's not saying, all right, the Lord has given, revealed something new to me. Here's a new commandment for you. It's not a new commandment. He is reminding them of an old commandment. They have had this commandment from the beginning, he says. I am writing an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. It is, it is a bedrock concept of Christianity. And the commandment, he says, the old commandment is the word which you have heard. All right, so the hearing, their hearing defines the beginning of when the commandment came to them. He's describing the beginning of the gospel amongst his hearers. So the commandment, the word, came from the apostolic preaching. The, the apostles emphasized the very things Jesus taught, which as to ethics, fall under this old commandment. This thing that Jesus said to them in the upper room, I'm giving you a new commandment, he says. Love one another. 
All right? That's the new commandment. But it becomes part and parcel of the apostolic teaching. First, we're, they call people to love God, but as they call people to love God, they teach them also to love one another. And we see in the, as we look, go through the book of Acts, we find the Christians learning how to do that. We find that there was a complaint in Acts chapter 6 where the Grecian widows, so these are Hellenized Jewish Christians, the Greek, Greek, Greek-oriented Jewish Christians were complaining that in the, in the uh, uh, church in Jerusalem, the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians seem to be not having the same level of care given to the widows among them as the Jewish, Ju- <laughs> the, uh, the Jerusalem Jewish Christians. Okay, so there was a distinction. There was a complaint. There's basically saying you're, you're, you're discriminating against us because we're not from here, <laughs> kind of thing. And so they, they solved the problem. What did they do? They appointed men as deacons, as servants, to serve and meet that need because they wanted to love one another. They're teaching them the commandment that Jesus taught to love one another. All right. So... Um, this is reflected in 1 John 3, verse 11. We have a, a word that speaks to this. He says, This is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So this commandment, singular, to love one another, is part of that message which you have heard from the beginning. It is a key to an ongoing intimacy with God. 1 John 2, 24 says, Whoever denies the Son... Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong verse. Verse 24, as, you, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So it is, it is this commandment, this thing that they heard from the beginning, to love one another, to love God and to love one another, is a key to ongoing intimacy with God. So loving the brethren is a fundamental concern for Christianity. If we love God, we ought to cultivate more and more love for one another. The world doesn't behave this way. The world is out for number one. The world takes advantage. The world seeks its own way. Remember when I was uh, in the mortgage business and I was, uh, I was doing an ad to try to drum up business for my own, uh, for my own uh, client base. And I was talking to my manager and I said, I wonder if, if people will think this is too... Uh, you know, I'm bragging too much about how good I am. <laughs> he says, oh, no. He says, everybody understands self-interest. <laughs> well, they do. They do. Because that's the way we all are. But Christianity teaches us that this is not the way we're supposed to live. We are to live to serve, to love one another, to try to find ways we can help one another. Love, in the 1 Corinthians 13 says, love thinks not of our own, but of one another. Love bears all things. Love assumes the best intentions. You know, one of the things, people do things that are are bad or that distress us or disappoint us. And, you know, our suspicious minds immediately say, well, they did that on purpose. Right? They, They did that on purpose. Love doesn't do that. Love assumes, well, they didn't mean to hurt me. They didn't mean to hurt so and so. They didn't mean it that way. That's what love does. Uh, it may turn out that love is wrong, but love does make that assumption. Love is oriented towards the other person and is not thinking about its own rights. Love lives with faults if, if it has to. So if you think through the 1 Corinthians 13 list, this describes how Christians should treat one another. The more you love God, the more your relationship should look like 1 Corinthians 13. All right. Now, granted, you have two people involved in relationships or more. And they aren't all on the same page. We do grant that. But as a Christian, there's a model. If we're going to abide in Christ, if we're going to walk with the Lord, there's a model for us that we find in the New Testament. So this commandment, this very this specific commandment, something Jesus uttered in the upper room, it's something that John never forgot, he constantly talked about, and it is a bedrock commandment of our Christian life. So then... Third point, it is a uniquely fresh and increasingly effective commandment. And so we come to verse 8. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you. 
So this seems to be a paradox. Is it old or is it new? The difference is not a case of Greek synonyms. It's the exact same word. He says, in the one hand, I am not writing a new commandment. Verse 7. On the other hand, verse 8, I am writing a new commandment. It's exactly the same Greek word. Sometimes we can get out of little difficulties like this because there's two different Greek words behind the English words. Well, we have no escape hatch that way this time. So the difference is a point of, in point of view. The commandment is all this way, in the sense that we find it at the very core of the gospel, in the sense that it is part of the ethics that Jesus taught right from the time when John and Peter and Andrew and all of them were disciples. The church has not yet been formed. Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross yet. It's the, first, the record we have it in John 13 is the night before he goes to the cross, but it is in keeping with his teaching throughout his ministry. So it is an old commandment. And in fact, we can trace it all the way back into the Old Testament where we get it to the second commandment, thou, thou shalt love your, thy neighbor as thyself. Now I've memorized it in the King James, so I sort of have to quote it that way, don't I? All right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? It is, it is a... This is an old commandment. It's one that God gave us a long time ago. But the commandment is new in this sense, that it is always fresh, alive, and vibrant. I have a quote, another one from Hebert. He says, The opening adverb does not introduce a new subject, but continues this, the matter of this love command, looked at in a new and different way. It is not a recent innovation, Yet it is qualitatively new as experienced in Christ. It's like, how shall we put it? Uh, how can I illustrate? If you think about a brand new morning. You know, if you get up early in the morning, the sun begins to dawn, the sky begins to lighten up, it's a new day, you got a new opportunity, you might have had some trouble yesterday, might have been, you know, they may not have ended right, but it's a new day. Well, it's really the same, you know, the planet's still turning the same way it always has. You know, like every new day. Is it really new or is it the same old thing? That's the idea. Is it really new or is it the same old thing? Well, it is new in this sense. It's a new opportunity. When it comes to this new commandment, it's old because it was given to us a long time ago. But it is its quality is new because it's so it's part of the new life. It's part of the life we have in the Lord Jesus. It's part of that walking with him. And then notice what it says. And here's here's the question part. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you. Now what does that mean? Well, the New American capitalizes the word him. It is true in him. They are pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's right. This commandment is fresh and new in him because of all Jesus did and said. It's new in emphasis. When Jesus said to the scribes, the first commandment is this, love God. The second commandment is this, love your neighbor. He was bringing the whole law and the prophets into one new fresh way of looking at it. It was true in him, in his teaching, in his emphasis. It is new in quality. The disciple is to love as Christ loved, not just as he loves himself. Right? We're to love like Christ. You know, we think about if we could love somebody or a whole host of people the way the Lord Jesus loved them, we would be as absolutely self-sacrificing as we could be. That is so unique in our world to find people who will just give up of themselves for other people. It's very refreshing when you meet somebody like this. It was true in him. You look at how the Lord Jesus lived his life. You know, when Jesus was uh, fed the 5,000, do you remember that story? All right. What has just happened? Well, his disciples have returned from a long 
out, they, he sent them out to do ministry. He's just got news that John the Baptist has been beheaded. His relative, now we don't know exactly the relationship, but he's somehow a relative. And of course he's the forerunner. And so he says, let's go to the other side of the lake and rest a while. And so they go to the other side of the lake and the people watch what he's doing and they run there. Thousands of them. So here he comes to the other side of the lake and he's tired. And there's thousands of people who want to hear him. What does Jesus do? Get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. No, he teaches them. He says, you know, these people are hungry. They didn't bring any food. We got anything? Philip says, well, there's this kid. He's, he's got a lunch. <laughs> What's that amongst so many? Jesus says, well, I'll show you. And he begins to blast that bread and break it, giving it to the disciples. They're, they put it in their baskets, take it out amongst the crowd. They keep going. The whole crowd is fed. And is this the one where there's 12 baskets left over? Is that the one? I think it is. I forget between the two, feeding the 4,000 or feeding the 5,000. Remember, Jesus wanted to go away and rest, but he loves. It's, this is so fresh in him. This is him. When you're tired, you know, I've, <laughs> when I'm tired, I have been known to be kind of snappy and sharp with people. I don't know if you, anybody of you have ever noticed that. That's true. And what I like to say, while I'm tired, I get to be this way. Is that how Jesus was? The commandment is new in him. It's fresh. New in extent. He told the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, the Jews hated the Samaritans. There's a long history of that. We won't get into that. They hated the Samaritans. And so here's this story. He tells this story of the Good Samaritan who takes care of the, the Jewish man who was beaten up by robbers. And the and Jewish man in the story wouldn't take care of him. Now, who was the neighbor, he says? That's very fresh. That's, the, that's what this new commandment looks like. It's so fresh. So new and so different from the way we think and act. It's new in apprehension since the concept of loving others is always fresh among those who live it. So one commentator says, Though doctrinal Christianity is always old, experimental Christianity is always new. What does he mean by that? Doctrinal Christianity is understanding what the Bible says. That's all the doctrine and the teaching, and that's old. But experimental Christianity, it's an old term, but what they mean by it is the way we live. If you live your life out abiding in Christ like Christ says you're supposed to, it is so fresh. People think, boy, you, there's something different about you. It's new in him and it's new in you. It's new in you if you will abide in him just as he abides in you. We were looking at that. Verse 5, last part says, By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And if we're going to do that, we're going to keep this new commandment. We're going to make it a part of our life. It's old because it's old. It was given to us a long time ago. It's new because every time it's applied in the life, it's fresh and real. The reason the Christian life is fresh is because the darkness is passing and the true light is shining. Another commentator says, The picture is that of a world in the darkness of night, but the first rays of the dawning sun have already begun to shine. More and more areas are becoming light instead of dark, and the light is getting brighter. If we live this way in the world, the light of the gospel shines in the lives of into the lives of the people around us who live in darkness. And it is, it is an amazing picture. The verbs are a continuous tense here. The Christian life doesn't begin fully mature, but it sets us on a new path and heads us in the right direction, the fresh direction. The true light shines in us. Our testimony becomes more and more distinct from the world, and our life becomes more and more attractive to the world. 
Now, a lot more could be said here, and we could make some very personal applications, I think, if each one of us were to examine our own lives about how well we truly love, we love God and we love others, how well we do this. But the more we abide in Christ and lay aside self and the world, the more, we impact, more impact our Christianity will have. So that proposition, the bedrock of the Christian faith, is a fresh way of relating to others and to God. And I think the weakness that we have in our own ministry is our deficiency in fulfilling the old and new commandment. It's the same commandment. It's old in the sense that it came from a long time ago. It's new in the sense that every time it's lived, it's fresh and it does something powerful in our world. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we've had here as we discuss this passage. Lord, I hope that it's been helpful and encouraging and stirred us up to be Christians who love one another and love the lost in our community. We pray that you'll guide in each of our daily encounters and help us help us to yield to you and to be a light in our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.